the live stream and we've entered the stream. That's always a wonderful <laughs> thing in Buddhism to be a stream enterer. So, unfortunately, the real stream enterer is a little bit more difficult than just turning logs on your computer. But then, nevertheless, we welcome everybody to another talk, another day, and it's amazing retreats. So, we'll start with by giving a Dhamma talk. Uh, the two talks which I've given so far, just on the meditation, uh, the early steps and a few deeper steps, and the simile which I introduced yesterday, is, it is one of my favorites, I must admit, the simile of a thousand petal lotus. And the wonderful thing about that is that what you do, which is basically nothing except be mindful and kind, that's all. And what is the purpose? It's not just discovering what's in the heart of the lotus. It's just understanding just how this whole practice works. And if you want to know the meaning of meditation, it's very well described as the eradicating or suppressing or restraining of the five hindrances. And once those five hindrances are restrained, then there's the opportunity as the Buddha said, to see the truth, to see things as they really are, rather than what you expect them to be. And this is one of those um, uh, teachings which inspired me from the very first time I took up Buddhism when I was a theoretical physicist. As a theoretical physicist, you were trying to find the truth, trying to find the essential meaning to this thing we call the world. And how come it's so difficult? And how come the, you know, the facts are out there, but people refuse to see it? And that is because of the workings of the five hindrances. The five hindrances are what distort your views, distort your perceptions, and even distort the way you think. In other words, we may be in front of something, we just can't see it. Why? Because we don't want to see it, or because we want something else. Those five hindrances, uh, you may even call them enemy number one in Buddhism. They distort the truth. And my best example of that which I love repeating, so most of you must have heard this before, was the simile of the, the flower pot experiment in, London, in uh, Imperial College. And this uh, was, it wasn't done by my friend uh, Bernard Carr, but he was involved. He was part of the back party who was doing this. And so one of these physicists, very well known in uh, Imperial College in London, said he knew how to levitate things, how to raise things up in the air, totally against the rules of science. And because he had a good reputation that he managed to invite, and they attended many senior physicists, and see this demonstration of levitation. And so it was in one of the big lecture halls in Imperial College and had many distinguished professors and experimenters were in the audience. And this gentleman came in to the lecture theater holding a flower pot. And he brought the flower pot and put it on the, the bench the table which you see uh, in lecture halls uh, where they do science experiments. <laughs> They'd already arranged for many cameras. This was uh, Imperial College. They had all the best equipment there. Video cameras, ultraviolet, infrared, everything, because they wanted to ensure that if it worked, they would have evidence to be recorded for posterity that levitation can happen. And so all these people were there waiting. And when this gentleman scientist put 
the flower pot on the table. Then he asked everybody, check it out for yourself if you wish. But in order to make this levitation work, I need your help to create the right atmosphere. So he asked all of these old professors, can you please, along with me, start chanting the Buddhist Hindu holy word, Om? And so all, all these old professors and lecturers wouldn't be dared, who wouldn't dare to be seen chanting Om in public, started to chant Om, Om, Om. And as they were chanting, flower pot rose into the air. It worked, it levitated. And they have photos and videos to prove it. It actually rose into the air. And then afterwards, it, it um, got back onto the table again. The experiment was a success. And the, the demonstrator, the scientist who was in front of the, the table, they were asked, what do people think about that? There was an amazing moment in science. They you know, overturned the law of gravity. What do you think? And that was when a couple of those chief scientists said, what are you talking about? That flower pot stayed on the table all the time. It didn't move. So they showed these two scientists the videos and the photographs it levitated, it moved, everyone saw it. And he said, nope, it was on the table all the time. And that became the purpose of the experiment. The flower pot did lift above the table. It wasn't a delusion. But for some of those scientists, that was such an impossibility. It couldn't happen according to their theories and views. And so their eyes just could not see it. It was blocked out from their perception. It never registered in their conscious awareness. They were honest. They said it didn't lift up above the table because it had been blocked out from their consciousness. Now, the truth of the matter was that underneath that table, that bench in the lecture theater, days before they had installed a very, very, very powerful electromagnet. And that was what was lifting the flower pot, the simple electromagnetism. And as you would all know, when you turn on a very heavy current, you can hear it humming. So they had to get everyone to chant, om, om, om. So I hide the trick. They turned on a very heavy current at that time. And it worked perfectly. They never suspected electromagnetism because they couldn't hear a special current being. The point was, if you see or hear anything which to you just cannot happen, which is impossible, it is deleted from your conscious awareness. Bear attention. Be a-R-E, attention, is not enough to see the truth. It is not there, devotees, in order not to challenge ourselves. And we add to our sense perceptions just to make some uh, sense out of what we see here, smell, taste, and touch. An example of that, I don't know if any of you have been around a long time Buddhist monks over in the UK. There was one of my friends, a very nice monk, called Ajahn Ananda. He was an American. He was born in Buffalo, uh, that's in New York, New York State. And he was a very rough guy when he was young. He told me that he joined these gangs uh, in Buffalo and they were going around with bicycle chains. He called it playing for kids. Keeps. And while he was in Vietnam, he got shot in the back of the head. He was laughing at one of his comrades who got a shot, a bullet in the foot. 
what they call like a million dollar wound. It means he would be out of the army, maybe walk with a limp for the rest of his life, but still be on the pension for the rest of his life. But as he was laughing at his friend, he got shot in the back of the head. He came so close to dying. When he got evacuated to the field hospital, the doctors saw what had happened to him and said he would probably never be able to see again as they had to take out with surgery that part of the brain which uh, deals with, with vision. And he made the resolution at the time. It's interesting. He was a really tough monk. But I remember that when he did some chanting over in Thailand, and he did it so sonorously, and all the other monks criticized him and said, you're not supposed to chant it so nice. We're forest monks. We're supposed to do it in an even tone. But he did it so beautifully. And all the other monks criticized him for that, except for me. There was the verses for inviting the heavenly beings to attend the ceremony. And when I saw him afterwards, he was very deflated, having been criticized in public by everybody. And I whispered to him, if I were a heavenly being, I would have come. That was beautiful chanting. And just that words of kindness made him my fear. You just say something kind. It means a huge amount to them. It's lovely having a friend for life. But anyway, he told me that he was going to commit suicide after the uh, after the uh, being shot in the head. But what happened to him? His sight was there. One day, he was playing a baseball match in the park, and whoever was batting hit the ball in his direction. It was a simple catch. The ball went high up into the air. He followed it with his eyes, and then the ball vanished. It disappeared. One of the weirdest things he'd ever seen. The ball was there one moment. He followed its trajectory, and now it had gone. And a second or two later, it reappeared. And he called. It, he realized that he had what we call a blind spot. Because of that injury, that was part of his field of vision it was just basically deleted. And he hadn't realized all this time that he was only seeing, say, 90% of the field of vision. It was only, because what had happened, what the brain does, is very deceptive. It filled in that missing area with what it expected to be there. So if there was a cloud, and you looked up into the sky, the brain would actually make the cloud, infer it, almost like draw it in. So there was a cloud there. If there was like a blue sky, it would just almost make blue sky in there. So he couldn't see that there was actually a blind or a, an empty space in his field of vision. When the ball was traveling in the air, that was something a bit unique. His brain didn't know what to do, so the ball disappeared. And he found from that how difficult it is to see delusion. Our perceptions can be very untrustworthy. And because of that, we always want to know, how can we know that we are seeing the truth? How many of you have noticed very good monks and nuns, good lay people, have been teaching all sorts of teachings about what meditation is, how to meditate, what the Dhamma is, and know how to interpret that Dhamma, what the Buddha said and what they think he said. There's so many different interpretations of the Dhamma, and that's just Buddhism. And when you actually start to see some of these other philosophies of life, why can't all these teachers agree on even what the Buddha taught? You know, the Buddha left this suttas for us to read, to talk about, to explain. Surely we must know what they mean. Why do we argue so much? And the point is that you don't know what they mean when these things called the five hindrances keep distorting our cognitive process. We don't see what is there on the page of the suttas. We see what we want to see. 
we interpret it, we bend it, we choose that part of the suttas which we like, which fits our understanding, and we just deny those parts which we don't agree with. That must have been added later on by somebody else. That's a wrong translation or whatever. That's why it's sometimes frustrating, especially for all you lay supporters on this retreat. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to believe? How am I supposed to practice? Please give us some steps. So that's one of the reasons why. Enemy number one, the five hindrances. You've got to find a way to weaken these five hindrances. To weaken them, to restrain them so much, they're almost deactivated for a while. And then once they are deactivated, then what we see, what we hear, what we smell, taste, touch, what we know has a ring of truth to it. That's what we can trust. Even in the Satipatthana Sutta of the Vipassana tradition, this was something which challenged me when I was a lay Buddhist. Because I remember the first translation of the Satipatthana Sutta, which I read, was by these two old Sri Lankan monks. And they were very highly motivated. They'd read in the Satipatthana Sutta that anybody anybody who practiced the Satipatthana Sutta properly for seven days. The seven days can be fully enlightened. If not fully enlightened, at least a non-returner. That's a pretty high state. So they thought, well, we've got a couple of weeks. Well, let's go to Burma, do Satipatthana, get enlightened, then we can come back to Sri Lanka again. You can interpret it the way the Buddha said it, that was true. Do the Satipatthana, then after seven days, there has to be something happened. So this was in the introduction to the translation of the Satipatthana Sutta, which I read. They did it for two weeks. And they did it again for two weeks, and nothing happened. And so afterwards, they thought, well, if nothing happens, what we'll do, we'll translate this into English, at least to make the, uh, the journey worthwhile. And that's where the translation came from. That was in the introduction. And that kind of stuck with me. Was it they weren't practicing it properly? Was it because they were lazy? Or was it this the Buddha was exaggerating? So I always remember that, wondering why the Satipatthana was not working. And then, of course, later on, when I started learning Pali, and looking at this for myself, you know, you, sh you saw very clearly the reason why all that practice of meditation, they were going through a lot of pain, really hard work. Why was it not working? It was because the very beginning of that Satipatthana Sutta, they have the prerequisites. Usually, if you've read that Sutta, or if you know it, you would have heard that one of the things which has to be done first of all before you practice any of those four Satipatthana practices is having abandoned grief and covetousness for the world. When I first read that, I thought, what is grief for the world? Sometimes you may have grief for your father who passed away, but grief for the world? Covetousness, it's a weird word. But, you know, you can sort of understand it, but covetousness for the world? I don't want the world, I just want peace. What does that actually mean? And these were the party words, uh, Vinaya, Vinaya, Loke, Abhija, Dhammanasa. Vinaya is, is, well, it's related to the word Vinaya. It means that like discipline, restraint, lesson, the power of. And the two important words is loke abhija and dhammanasa. And because I was reading through the Pali and Guttara Nikaya at the time, because I was told that's the best way to learn Pali. 
you have a dictionary next to you and read. It's not that hard to understand. And I kept on coming across the two words, loka abhija, again and again and again. Those were two words, loka abhija. It was the way the Anguttara Nikaya usually called the first of the five hindrances. It was a synonym, the same as karma chandra is the usual word in Pali. Loka Abhija was a synonym, an alternative. And then I looked at a couple of suttas, only two, where I found Dhammanasa as the alternative, the synonym for Wayapada, the second hindrance. And then it came quite clear to me, just by my own reading, that Vinaya Loka Abhija Dhammanasa means having restrained the first two of the five hindrances. Then you can do Satipatthana, not before. And when I looked in the commentaries, because each one of these suttas, they have these things called commentaries, maybe a thousand years after, and probably started earlier than that. But no, actually not five, it's about 500 years after. People like Venal Buddhaghosa over in Sri Lanka started trying to explain some of the missing features of these great suttas. And in the two Satipatthana suttas, there the commentary says exactly what I've just said. It said when it says uh, the usual English translation, having abandoned grief and covetousness for the world. That, be, <clears throat> that means having restrained the first two hindrances. And in Pali, when you mention the first two of a common group, a very common group like five hindrances, that should be understood as including all five. It's just the idiomatic usage of Pali which occurred in that time. So what it means, according to those texts, is that before you even do Satipatthana, you have to have restrained the five hindrances, weaken them. Otherwise, it won't work. So that's one of the reasons why. And so many other places in the suttas, it mentions the five hindrances. They're the ones which block wisdom, which weaken your stillness. <laughs> So understanding that, we realize that the purpose of our meditation is actually to weaken hindrances. It's not just have a good time, which you do have a good time. The good time in the deep meditations, that is to almost like encourage you to be brave enough to let go. Very often, I know one meditator very well, is on the edge of these jhanas, the hindrances almost disappeared, very peaceful, nimittas are very bright, and it's like you can see from the bliss of Nibbana, just one step, bliss of not Nibbana, sorry, the bliss of Jhana, one step away. You think, no, I can't do this, it's just too big for me, too powerful. It's the fear which comes up. And it's not like the fear of losing something, it's a fear of something so great and so powerful, so huge, that we don't know how we can handle it. If you saw a huge monster, it might be the friendliest monster of all, like the cookie monster or something, I don't know. A nice friendly monster, this is the size of it. You realize that you know, this has got so much power, you get a bit uh, trepid uh, being in their company. This is like the bliss of deep meditation, so awesome. It brings up that fearful awe. But I remember that person sort of commenting, that yes, it was fearful, but why not? You have to have that courage, and that courage inspired by the teachings of others. Give it a try, just make that step, go in. So this is why those meditations, please have that courage, take that step, go in and see what it's like in there. But when you do see what it's like in there, those deep meditations, they have a 
effect on you afterwards. This is not why you're in the chakra. And this, I always give the quote, this is the Manalaka Pana Sutta, as I've been imagining the kind. Manalaka Pana. Manalaka Pana Sutta, it says that anyone who has experienced that jhana and comes out, they will be free of the five hindrances for a long time. And they will also be free of these other two qualities called tandi and arati. Tandi is like lethargy, weariness, and also like discontent, arati. So this is how the Buddha described when you emerge from those deep meditations, what you experience is this absence of the five hindrances and also this energy and no discontent. It's one of the reasons why, if you've had one of these deep meditations, you're not sleepy, you're not tired. Sometimes you can't sleep at night. Don't worry about that. You can sleep later on. Enjoy the powerful experience in the mind. You're just brimming over with energy. And RRT, there's no discontent. Nothing can upset you. That's one of the reasons why. Please listen to the whole simile because I don't want you to take me to court and sue me. Sometimes when somebody comes up to me, and says, oh, I've had this wonderful deep meditation. It was so blissful. It was a jhana. I look at them and say, no, I'm sorry, but Polish women can't get jhanas. I'm looking at Anna in front of me. Polish women, they can't get jhanas. And then I just see how she responds. And if she responds like she's doing that, smiling and giggling, fine, okay, that could have been a jhana. But if they say, how are you to say that? That is discriminatory, that is wrong. Then I realize, yeah, it wasn't a jhana. You're just trying to stir people up, <laughs> trying to get a response from them of negativity. Of course, everybody can uh, achieve jhanas. There's, there's no distinction there at all. And if I am gonna be discriminatory, I'm gonna be discriminatory now. This is just my uh, experience over many years of teaching jhanas. But I'm being honest now. But it's more women experience jhanas than men. I don't know why, but you have a better chance of it. Honest. Anyway, that's just anecdotes. Not everyone might know the five hindrances. So oh, yeah, the five hindrances, I will now describe what they are. The five hindrances, so you know what I'm talking about. Five hindrances, in brief, summarizing them. The first one is like, it's called karma chanda. The word chanda does not mean just desire. It means that you are wanting, consenting, enjoying, permitting, just you know, your pursuit of pleasure in the five senses. Sensual desire, wanting in that sensual desire. You don't see what's there, you see what you want to see. Good example of that, please excuse me, is not just monk talk, this is just Buddhist talk. If any of you have ever fell in love, or when you fall in love, oh, she's the most beautiful partner in the whole world. There's nothing like her or him or whatever gender you are. You ever seen like young people falling in love? And sometimes you you look at that, so that girl or that boy, what do you see in him? He's ordinary. Oh no, he's not. He's gorgeous, he's beautiful, he's so kind. Have you ever noticed when people fall in love, they exaggerate the truth? They exaggerate qualities, they see what they want to see, or what's actually there. And a couple of years later. They separate when they get divorced. And they think, why did I marry him? He was terrible. He was awful. It's the same person. But when you have negativity, you see what you want to see. You see the negative part of that person. 
This is any psychologist would notice that sometimes we forget that one of the first psychologists was the Buddha. We see what we want to see. We cannot see what we don't want to see. Just like that flower pot. It bends perception. So when you are meditating, you just you know you're just calming the mind down. Why do we think all these thoughts? Because you bend perception to think these thoughts are really important. That you understand the truth and no one else does. You think of these thoughts, these ideas, as more important than being peaceful. So often, you will find out if you suspend that thinking process and just be still, just for a short while, your mind becomes so powerful, so um, penetrating, that you can see answers to ordinary problems in this world, let alone the problems in deep meditation or the problems of philosophy or the problems of who you are. So you need a powerful mind to get powerful solutions. And when you have likes and dislikes, wants and not wants, you'll find you'll never see the truth as it really is. you see as you want to see it. And a good example of that, you know, is with things like uh, the jhanas. They are so important. You read the suttas on every other page. And there's quotes like in the Gopika Moggallana Sutta, after the Buddha passed away, Ananda was the go-to monk. Now he was with the Buddha for so many years. And so they would ask him all sorts of questions. And in this um, sutta, they asked him, they asked you know, Venerable Ananda, what type of meditation did the Buddha teach? You know what the, the Ananda answered? He never answered Vipassana, Samatha. He answered, the Buddha only recommended four types of meditation. First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. It's very powerful when you read those suttas with a clear mind, not looking for what you want to see, but looking for what's there. It's so powerful. So anyway, so it is these jhanas are what's necessary to eradicate those five hindrances temporarily. And that's what it says in the, the Nalaka Pana Sutta. It stops you wanting anything. It stops you being in, in denial to things. Your mind is just too still and open and pure to get stuck in this sort of stuff. Which means that you have that poise and penetration necessary to penetrate to the truth. So not wanting, not not wanting. It's one of those reasons why many years ago that when that I'd uh, stopped really going to prisons to teach, I gave that job to another monk to, to go to prisons and teach. And this monk went to one of those jails, a high security jail just been built uh, in Western Australia. And he was a very nice character. And so one day the prisoners in that jail, they invited him to stay a bit longer. They'd found out that he could take tea and cheese and chocolate in the evening. So they had some prepared for him. Because they wanted to talk with him, and, you know, have some friendship with him. So they asked him, what's it like in a monastery? <coughs> Excuse me. What's it like in a monastery in Australia? And so they described the routine of a monastery in Australia. Said, we get up at four o'clock in the morning. And that shocked the prisoners. But the monk, actually, he's an honest monk. He did say, by getting up at 4 a.m. Is, is optional. You can always get up earlier if you want, but not late. That's the only other option. And I said, wow, even murderers in jail don't have to get up that early. What bad karma did you monks do to have to get up so early in the morning? 
And then what do you do? Can you watch the TV? No, there's no TV in the monastery. You have to just meditate. Okay, fair enough. Then what about your breakfast? What do you have for breakfast? And in Bodhinyana Monastery in those days, breakfast was really simple. All I could ever have was uh, a mug with three um, Weetabix in, and some milk and a cup of tea, that's all. That's all. In prisons in Australia these days, I'm sure it's the same as prisons here in in UK. You know, you can have bacon and eggs, you can have pancakes, you can have noodles if you're Asian, you can have anything. You know, the pancakes, everything. The, the, the choice is so vast. That's all we've got. Now, what do you do after lunch, after breakfast? You know, can you sort of play a game of sport or something, play football? Oh, we can't do that. We work. And honestly, if you see some of the work, which we do, the building work, the maintenance work, the monks really get into it. It's actually good fun. It's good bonding and just get some energy out of you. And then, okay, they'll never get us to work that hard in a prison. We go on strike. Do prisoners go on strike in UK? I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure they'll resist. Sorry? Yeah. Really? Well, they refuse to do it. Anyway, refuse to cooperate. I've seen it. They go on the roofs and protest. <laughs> anyway, what do you have for lunch? And of course, I mean, you've seen, I hope, in these monasteries, we eat out of a bowl. And everything goes in the same bowl all at once. So I remember some of the delicious meals I've had, such as strawberry ice cream on spaghetti bolognese. It's only one bowl. So it gets put on top and the strawberry ice cream starts to melt and soak into your spaghetti bolognese. Do you think that's disgusting? Have you ever had it? How do you know it's disgusting? It is disgusting, I can affirm that. But anyway, they said, wow, that's, even in solitary confinement, they give you a tray and the different things are separated on the tray. I said, okay, what do you do after lunch? You know, do you, can you play against some sports? Watch the TV? No, we meditate. And what about in the evening? What time is dinner? Dinner? We, we like the same as day precepts. We don't have dinner. Oh, that's a bit rough. What do you do in the evening then? Can you sort of play cards or play games? No, monks don't do that. We meditate some more. And to be honest, that at that time, I always remember this. It was a very good monk, a very honest monk. Because the prisoners asked him, don't you get bored with meditation? He said, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> what time do you go to bed? Bed? I don't have a bed. In my monastery, I sleep on the floor. And these prisoners were so surprised at a monk's lifestyle, which was much worse than a prisoner in Australia. But one of them, forgetting where they were, had so much compassion for the monk and said, that's terrible in your monastery. Why don't you come in here and stay with us instead? He was invited stay in a, a prison because it was far more comfortable so when he came back and told us that we all had a good laugh but afterwards we started saying to ourselves what is the difference between a monastery and a prison why is it that in Bodhinyana monastery most monasteries there is a waiting list of people trying to get in long way and in prison there's a waiting list of people trying to get out what's the difference and from that you've got this wonderful little simple insight a prison is any place you do not want to be and a monastery a vihara is any place you want to be that's freedom it doesn't matter what the place is. If you're happy to be here, 
you are free. If you want to be somewhere else, you're in jail. Even when you're meditating. You don't know how many times you're meditating and you think, oh, how many more minutes are there to go? Oh, I just don't want to be here. Just meditate. And even if, you know, it's not the best meditation in the whole world, but you're just happy to be here, happy to be peaceful sitting here. And if you're happy to be here, you feel this wonderful sense of freedom. If you think there's something more to attain, then you made a prison for yourself. You want to be somewhere else. And that becomes what is uh, freedom and what is being in jail. Those first two hindrances. And because of all that wanting, and because of all that sometimes the ill will, I don't want to be here. Imagine what that does to your brain. It gives it so much work that you get tired. That is what consumes up all the energy. So your brain becomes slow and dull. It's not engaging with the meditation or engaging with anything. It's negative. It wants to go somewhere else. That's where sloth and torpor come from. And how do we react to sloth and torpor? Come on, do something. You drive the mind through willpower, through wanting or not wanting. And that's what causes the restlessness. Because you can't be still. And most people, when they're meditating, are either between restlessness or remorse. So sorry, sorry, they're either uh, stuck between restlessness or sloth and torpor. They're either too dull or too active. And that's a great shame. Whenever I suffered sloth and torpor as a young monk, I would try. I would do all sorts of tricks to try and make my, my sloth and torpor go away. Sometimes it would go away. And once I kind of woke up, then I'd be restlessness again. When I was restless, thinking too much, calm the mind down, calm the mind down, and I'd fall asleep again. Many people have that problem with the five hindrances, either between sleepiness or dullness, or too much thinking. And they can't find that middle way, that middle point. It was only because, and this is what we always encourage you to do, to use your, your experience. Find out why are you uh, dull when you meditate? Why? And I found out that on one occasion I had to go off to Bangkok to do a visa. And on that time, we could actually stay in this new building, one of the big monasteries in Bangkok. And it had uh, mosquito screens. That was the first thing. So we weren't bothered by mosquitoes at night. And so in that room, we could have a good sleep. And if you go out in the morning on arms, and you got good food, the nutritious food. And then we found there was a building in that monastery which had an air con in it. And we had got the key because we wanted to use that in the early morning. We get up at 3 o'clock, 3.30, we went into this air-conditioned room to meditate for a couple of hours before the morning arms round. And I was so surprised. You could turn on the air con in that room and you had no sloth and torpor at all. Born in Acton, here in London, was only caused because my body was not used to meditating in these hot, steamy jungles. It was not used to only sleeping four hours at night. It was not used to having this food, which was, you know, totally just, um, I was malnourished. Because of that, the sloth and torpor was there. And as soon as you dealt with the physical problems, you could sleep enough, have enough nutritious food for yourself, and be in an environment not too cold, not too hot. You find, for me, that dealt with the sloth and torpor. And instead of fighting it, you made peace with it, it disappeared, and the restlessness 
never came. It was in the middle, this beautiful part. Five hindrances were arising. And the last part of the five hindrances was doubt. The doubt is a difficult one to describe. I know the Buddha described doubt as being lost in a in a in a jungle, well, in a desert. Lost in a desert with no signposts, so you don't know where you are. It reminded me of this simile of this man who had been lost in the desert for days and he was just about to die. He was crawling on his hands and knees, dehydrated, just didn't know where he could find any water. And as he was crawling through this really hot, dry jungle, on the horizon, he saw a shimmer on the horizon. It was not what he'd seen before. He thought, oh, I'm really losing it. It's a mirage. But as the shimmer on the horizon came a bit closer, it really looked like there's a person coming towards him. He said, this can't be right. As it came closer, it really looked as if it was one of these Inuits. You know, they used to call them Eskimo. These Inuits on a sled being pulled by four husky dogs in the middle of the jungle. Yeah, sorry, not in the jungle, sorry. In the middle, middle of the desert. What is the sled with Inuit in furs and husky dogs doing in the desert? He thought he was really going crazy. As it often you do under the heat. And really up crazy dogs are barking and they start to lick him. It was real. And he realized, oh my goodness, this is a miracle. I've been rescued. And he told this Inuit, covered in furs, he said, I've been lost in this desert for days. Right. And you think you're lost. <laughs> That's a joke, okay. Now the real symbol, <laughs> the real for the doubt, this was adapting them to give nice examples. When I was a young man, I liked solitude. Even when I was a student, I had girlfriends, but I was one of our north. Yeah, exactly where it was, but way north of Port William. And when I went up there, I was staying at a youth hostel. There was only another guy there, one more guy, the youth hostel manager. We decided one day, it was a lovely day, to go and walk up one of the mountains. Just, no, just leisurely. We got to the top of the mountain. Still a lovely day. I said, look, there's another mountain up there. Do you want to go up there? He said, no. I said, oh, well, I'll go up there by, up there by myself. And I found out why. To the next mountain. Before I got to the top, these clouds came in from the, the west. So fast. It was a beautiful, clear summer's day. Now it was cloudy. And those clouds, they descended over the mountain. And I was covered in mist. I could put my hand down, I couldn't see the mist, not knowing which way I should go. I always thought I had a good sense of direction. And when I was retracing my steps, it was very scary because I came across a precipice. It was only one more step and you'd never be able to see me again. I'd been dead. There's a cliff there. I found out later when I went back to the hospital. I survived, obviously. When I found out which way I'd been walking, it would be totally the opposite direction I thought I was going in. That really scared me. This was like life. And there's no mobile phones or anything in those days. It was 19, probably 1970 or 71. So I, I was a scientist. So I was studying theoretical physics. That's one thing I knew. The water always flowed downhill. So I found one of the streams up on that mountain. It's only a small little stream. And I followed it. I resolved I would follow that stream whichever way it curled, because I knew it would always go downhill. Remember, I could only see a step in front of me. As I followed that stream, it met another little stream, got bigger, and then another one. And all the time I was going downhill. And when I got to a certain 
So I just one more step, and I was underneath the mist. And you could see it all the whole locality now. The mist is only at a certain level. You go lower, and then that mist disappears almost immediately. And I realized what a great simile for doubt and overcoming doubt that was. You're not quite sure which monk or nun to follow. You're not really quite sure what practice you should do. There's so much out there. So do the practices which lead downhill, which lead to more peace, more clarity, more contentment, more virtue. If you have a retreat and you go home and you're more pain in the arse than you were when you left, that's not meditation. If it leads to more peace, clarity, virtue, then you know that's in the right direction. Keep going down in that direction. You have to see which way to go. The doubt would have been caught. That's the simile which I found the best for overcoming doubt, which means that you are free. The five hindrances, and I'm sure I'll talk about those again, didn't really finish with them, they are overcome limitations. And they stay overcome. That gives you the, the opportunity to find safety, to see truth, and also to enjoy the, the bliss. Thank you for listening. Okay. Okay. So shall we give people until about five past or yeah, sure. longer? Maybe ten past? Ten past if you yeah, wish. Fifteen yeah. minutes or so. And then you also can have a cup of tea because we're being very well looked after by our wonderful friends Anna and Tehani and Derek as well person he's in the downstairs room <laughs> so um please follow suit and enjoy your cup of tea and this little break and remember you can do your walking meditation on the way to the kettle <laughs> and on the way back and also do running meditation <laughs> go fast the toilet meditation okay welcome everybody now we're going to do the, the guided meditation as we do <laughs> after the, uh, the talk. So, first of all, have kindness to your body. See if you can get your body as comfortable as it possibly can be. Sometimes I remember looking at dogs and they sit down, they circle around the place they're going to sit down a couple of times and then they just sit down, they're very comfortable. Sometimes I feel like doing that over my meditation seat, walking around it one or two times, and then sitting down. Not too much. The, the, dog. the dogs are very comfortable. I don't know why human beings find it difficult to find a comfortable spot. So we should learn from dogs. They're very kind, very wise. So find a comfortable position. Close your eyes and see if you can start the meditation with a smile. This is not an endurance task. This is learning how to, as I said in that talk, about you are free and you're happy to be here, wherever here happens to be. So even in a jail. If you're happy to be there, you can be very peaceful. I remember once being in a, I think it was actually a six star hotel in Japan. And there was this, I didn't want to be there, so it was too luxurious. So you can be in prison, even in a hotel room. So right now, here you are. See if you can be happy to be here. May not be the best, but it's pretty good. And with your perception, see if you can notice all the wonderful features, 
of your meditation spot right now. Where you're meditating, it might not be as cool as you like. But it could be much warmer and more uncomfortable. It may not be as quiet. It could be noisier. It may not be as peaceful as you like. There's no mosquitoes here biting you. But look for the good parts of where you are right now. And so you can really say that you are actually quite happy to be here. When you are happy to be here, find you don't need to think so much. You're developing what we call contentment, ease. That's why you find that animals like the dogs, it's amazing where they can find a comfortable spot to sit. Where they can find ease. When you're very demanding in nature, it's very hard to find a peaceful place. But as we chanted, last night as we'll chant tonight to be content and easily satisfied not far and demanding in nature that's in the Metta Sutta the English translation of it content easily satisfied not far or demanding in nature So as I'm sitting here as a monk, I know I don't have to answer any questions, maybe later on, but right here, right now, I have some freedom. I don't have to work hard building stuff or traveling. I can just sit quietly here. Please remember that for yourselves. Don't just know what you're doing. Reflect on what you don't have to do right now. All that work, that busyness, the next hour you don't have to do at all. You can be free. That sense of contentment comes with focusing on the freedoms which you have right now. helps you make peace in this moment. And even your body, your body may not be the best. You may be old, sick, creaky. It's like the old buildings. But they're good enough. Good enough for the purpose of meditation. And when you start off with a positive attitude towards the meditation place and your body, you can care for this body and also be grateful that it's fit enough to allow you to meditate. Thank you, body. And I'm grateful that I have a soft cushion to rest my backside on while I meditate. I can be peaceful. And you have no busyness, so no one is likely to disturb you. Oh, what joy. When you see the comfort in this moment, makes it so much easier for your mind to find peace. As soon as you see a little bit of peace, you'll find more peace and more and more. 
type of perception is now. Let's see how much peace is there. Or the enjoyment of. But don't spoil the peace by thinking you have to get into this deep state of meditation or that deep state of meditation. Peace is appreciated where you are right now. And that peace grows. It deepens. Now it's more solid, more refined. And all these other stages of meditation are developed from that initial experience of peace. Even one of the most profound of meditations, the fourth jhana. Other times they call that contentment. Sorry, sometimes they call it equanimity. I prefer the word contentment or upeka. And that's the highest form of mindfulness in that fourth jhana. We're all coming, developing from the deepening and solidifying of peace. Grant yourself a moment of peace and you realize how unnecessarily you have scurried about thinking and planning. Unnecessarily. If you can learn to dwell in that peace and experiencing it deepen and grow. Sometimes when I do these guided meditations, you just start off like this until you can feel that peace so strongly that your body is already relaxed and the mind is already focused and mindful in this present moment because that's where peace lives. When you have peace, there's no need to do anything that disturbs the peace. So you soon get used to and skilled at Maintaining the peace within your own body and mind. Within. And how easy it is to be at peace. You don't do anything. Just rest. Your awareness is strong. You're doing stopped. It's like you work so hard, you have arrived at such a beautiful place of peace. Sit down and enjoy it. It's weird when you begin to stop. Not go anywhere, do anything, just enjoy this moment. Sometimes it's like finding, finding a seat up in the mountains. When you first sit on that seat, it's cold, hard, and uneven. When you first, as it were, sit down in the present moment. That's what it feels like. Cold, a bit uneven, not that uh, even, not that um, comfortable. But you find that after every second you're still. That stone seat up in the mountains warms up, 
because you are even or more soft. The present moment becomes more comfortable the longer you sit in it. Because you're not expending effort in doing things, all that effort, all that energy goes into knowing and being kind. How do you feel now? Are you kind by opening the door of your heart, no matter what you're experiencing? Not rejecting energy, but being at peace with things. If you are, your mindfulness grows. This body is comfortable and the mind is reasonably still. Maybe you can be aware right now of your breathing. This breath has given me the oxygen in my life. It's given me the energy to live, build monasteries, raise funds write books to teach. Without that oxygen, I could not be here. I have this wonderful gratitude for all the oxygen which has been coming into my body. My lungs were releasing the byproducts afterwards. The oxygen feeds me. That oxygen comes from all that is green in the world. When I breathe out the carbon dioxide, that is my gift to the flowers and the trees. And my breathing is what connects me to nature. So to me, it's almost sacred, beautiful. When my breath becomes important, valuable, and it's so much easier to observe. And one thing I have noticed, that every breath that I breathe in is unique. I'm not just saying that. The breath I'm breathing in right now is different than any other breath I've ever breathed in. It makes them easier to watch. I know from experience you will have to take it on trust by just breathing in not doing anything else, keeping it simple. It's a wonderful gift for my health, my wisdom, my tranquility and kindness. I deserve to give this tranquility my body and mind.
it very closely the end of this meditation. Where was it? I always use the last minute or two of the meditation just to assess what worked and what didn't. Whereby meditation is always a learning experience. Day by day, week by week, year by year, the meditation becomes a more refined skill. You have learned and honed yourself. And I encourage people to please open their eyes. If you wish, you can finish the meditation with a smile. Very good. Shit, <laughs> fun doing some sort of dance. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.